Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Frank Holmes. Uh, Frank is the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of U.S. Global Funds. Uh, we've uh, had Frank on before, and a lot of times I don't like to read people's bios again because I, I think I'm eating into some valuable time, taking away from the wisdom that they can uh, provide for us. But I do want to just pass along for those of you who may not know Frank, and I can't believe there's many of you out there, uh, that uh, he has had a, you know, quite an impressive background as a chief investment officer at U.S. Global. Frank oversees an investment team whose mutual funds have won more than two dozen Lipper Fund awards uh, and certificates since the year 2000. Uh, Frank was selected as the uh, 2006 Mining Fund Manager of the Year by Mining Journal. That's a leading publication for global natural resources. He is also the uh, co-author of uh, The Gold Watcher, Demystifying Gold Investing. He is engaged in a number of international philanthropic uh, organizations, and he's a member of the President's Circle and on the Investment Committee of International Crisis Group, which works to resolve conflicts around the world. He is also an advisor to the William J. Clinton Foundation on Sustainable Development in Countries with Resource-Based Economies. So you see, Frank has had uh, quite a good background, quite an impressive background, so it's really an honor to have uh, Frank with us again. Thanks for joining me, Frank. Well, it's great to be here at year end. Yeah, it's great to be here at year end, and I'm hoping that you can tell us you're going to have uh, some good news for us in 2015, particularly those of us who have been focused more than we should have been, perhaps, in the precious metal sector. Um, let's, let's start off with uh, getting your views on the global economy, Frank. Um, so where where are we in the United States now? We know we're told that the U.S. is uh, the shining light to the world. We have a, an economy that's uh, well, it isn't doing as good as it should be doing, but it's the best thing there is around the world, uh, and that we're pulling ourselves out, and things are actually pretty good. And you know, you're a fairly optimistic person, uh, so I'm I'm sort of believing that you'll agree with that. I do. Uh, when you have uh, such big monetary stimulus that we had for three years, uh, it's, it's now bleeding into the, into the system. And uh, we had a, a renaissance of an oil boom uh, that also led to it. And a lot of people don't realize that fracking just wasn't for um, North Dakota and uh, Texas. Uh, it had a phenomenal job activity, high-paying jobs across the country, like railway, uh, mm-hmm. all those handlers that move sand. So I know from San Antonio going to work in the morning, if I missed it by five minutes, I would wait 20 minutes in the morning for trains coming by, taking down equipment and sand to South Texas. Hmm. And then in the afternoon, uh, it's taking back oil. And uh-huh. it's remarkable to see. So you have sand coming from Michigan, from Illinois, coming south or going west, going east. So there's been a, a real, true, a big economic boom that's taken place. All right, so uh, that that puts some color behind the numbers that we hear in the in the mainstream media to to know that Frank Holmes is going to have to wait uh, behind uh, the trains going by for twenty minutes if he if if he's five minutes late getting out the door. Uh, you know, Frank, um, I, I I'm a, I really wanted to ask you a little bit before we got in even into the economy a little bit. I'd like you to talk a little bit about your company, U.S. Global. And the symbol is G-R-O-W, I believe. And one of the reasons I want to ask you about it is because Jeb Hanverger, who I had on with me just a minute ago, uh, raved about how he made so much money and grow a number of years ago. I see the stock is down uh, considerably now from where it was. Uh, but, but how are things going at grow? I mean, they can't be as good as they were in the boom years, I suppose. But, but how are things going? And uh, what sort of net asset value do you have relative to the share price? Well, it's it's we have a very reflexive cost structure. So as costs go, as as assets go down, um, then our costs start to adjust. Just never as quick as we'd like. We have low salaries, Jay, and most of the big income comes from only performance and mm-hmm. the size of assets. And it's very a performance entrepreneurial culture. Uh, and we're no load, so it's not sales. Uh, uh-huh. as a culture. So with that, the stock has come down because the assets have declined. Mm-hmm. And the assets have declined from a peak of uh, over $6 billion to a billion and change. Uh, uh-huh. and, and that's a function, in particular since 2011, 
you've seen emerging markets and resources decline. And it doesn't matter if you're a number one fund in that space, uh, the overall assets have declined. The other factor that's impacted growth has been no seeing nothing go up in interest rates in the short-term money fund space. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, all the FATCA rules and banking rules, etc., have put a real burden on the cost structure we can't re- be reflexive with. So we mm-hmm. end up uh, getting rid of our money funds, and uh, we have a relationship uh, with U.S. Uh, Bank Corp uh, for people to have money funds to go back and forth with our funds. Mm-hmm. But we got rid of that, and, and then we basically had to shave out and it, because it was costing almost $2 million a year to maintain money funds that, for that just cost structure. So we're, that's, that does impact. So you have less assets, but at the same time, we have less costs associated with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess people could do their research on grow, but it might, might be something at, at these low prices uh, because if, we're, if Jeb Handwerger is right and, and 2015 should be a better year for resource companies, then uh, I suppose that would also reflect uh, favorably on grow. I see also that you are um, looking at po- the possibility of uh, starting, uh, s- uh, join, uh, becoming a, a provider of some ETF products. We will have ETFs coming out, um, and uh, which we're very excited about. Um, their factor model, so there's a, they, they do adapt and adjust uh, to the dynamics of the market. And uh, we were coming uh, with one that uh, basically got delayed with this demise of energy. It's high royalty, high dividend paying uh, income companies. Um, but it's always difficult to go out and be contrarian for people to have the courage. Most people in the ETF world, it's only when the fund or that asset class is a 50, above its 50-day and 200-day moving average yeah. that you see funds flow into it. So yeah. there really aren't many contrarian investors Lots of talk, but little action. Right. Well, it's it's uh, understandable because it allows people to to move back and forth in in and out of different places, real quickly. So, but they have become very popular. But I'd like to ask you before we get back into some more economic topics, uh, the near term fund is a new fund that you've put into place. Uh, talk about that a little bit, Frank. What's the uh, what what's the story with the near term fund? Well, we like to call it, you know, from a, from a positioning in the, in the hearts and minds of investors, our no drama fund. <laughs> and there's no drama because the fund's been around for a long time. It's by short-term tax-free, AAA-rated uh, munis. And um, there's several factors. It's a five-star fund. I have um, $10 million, and I've, I've made a commitment into uh, uh-huh. putting my money into it it's because it's stable. And what makes it special is that in 14 years, it's not had a down year. So that makes it non-drama. But mm-hmm. the past is no guarantee of the future. It's always important, and that's a reality we all live with. Maybe they'll change the muni laws, but based on its investment strategy of how we use the volatility of markets with our quant models, and being a scavenger opportunistic buyer, uh, we don't go try to buy the big, you know, multi-million dollar lots. We will buy $375,000 because a broker wants to sell it. He's distressed. We quickly know the fundamentals of the, of the bond, and mm-hmm. uh, we accumulate them. So we have been able to generate, and what's really important for investors is that we have a story of two guys in the year 2000 are all golfing, and one says, hey, Joe, I'm going to put $100,000 in the S&P. Uh, it's been unbelievable, 18.5% compound rate of return for the past decade. It's almost a triple. And his friend says, you know what? I'm retiring in 10 years, and I think I'm going to be a little more cautious with my $100,000 bonus. I'm going to put it into short-term tax-free, near-term. Well, the guy in the S&P lost 40% of his money. And then it took him basically seven years to get back to break even. Uh-huh. And then 2008 came along, and he lost 40% again. Yeah. And it wasn't until 2012 that he finally broke even with his hundred grand, and now he's 67 years old. Well, yeah. the, other, the other personality, he turns around every year, He's been up, and he's not had to deal with that emotional volatility. So mm-hmm. we've tried to educate investors that they should not have all their money in one asset class. Like we've always written about gold, 10% in gold, not 100%. You put 10% and you rebalance each year, and you have money in the stock market. And with these low interest rates, near term is even more attractive because the yield is substantially higher than any money fund. And to lower its volatility, 
It's a $2 NAV. So that means that penny motion very seldom happens. So you can have underlying lots of volatility in the, in the capital markets, but the ten dollar fund, if it moves uh, five pennies, is before a two dollar fund is going to move one penny. Sure. Yeah. And so it's structured that way to be a safe harbor to put your money, and to and if you need an opportunity to go and buy a house or buy a car or make more investments because gold is down this year, then you rebalance and you can buy gold. So near term is one of those great core products that someone should have for the investments and in this low interest rate environment. And I don't think rates are going to be able to rise quickly next year because the fiscal drag and regulations are so great. Last year when rates went to rise, track housing immediately came to a halt. Mm-hmm. So, and, and Barnanke came out and, and it was a Wall Street Journal story that he had difficulty refinancing his mortgage because all of a sudden <laughs> all the rules he wasn't aware of. So yeah. I think that fiscal drag, as they like to call the regulations of banking, etc., we're going to have to take years to digest them all, and Frank Dodd, and that means we're going to live with cheap interest rates, and that's what happened in Japan looking back 24 years ago. So the cheap rates will come because of a uh, the drag in the economy, the fiscal drag, and uh, a lackluster economy, possibly? Yes, and so any spike in interest rates merely curtail buying. Uh, yeah. People don't qualify. I was told last year when markets started to pick up in the fall that all these people that put down money for track housing because of the oil boom, that, that 50 basis points move in the, th- in the 30-year mortgage, they no longer qualified. They should wow. be qualified because they have to have so much money up. They have, it's a much higher ratio of income to interest payment. Right. So even right. though rates are cheaper, they didn't qualify. So all of a sudden you saw the government come in and start buying mortgages with their program to get rates back down to maintain economic stability. Yeah, that's incredible. It's really incredible when you think about the as low as rates are now. And, Frank, you know, I'm, you and I have been around for a while, I a little longer than you, I think, and I remember – very clearly, uh, seven, my first mortgage is 17.5% mortgage here in New York City, and I can't imagine, uh, you know, if we went to just 6 or 7%, it would start knocking people. I mean, it's, it's, just, an, it's just unfathomable. So I, I think you're right about that. I, and, you know, the biggest, probably the people and the friends of mine that have been most wrong for the longest are not even those that bet on gold, but those that bet on the, uh, on the decline in the U.S. Treasury. So, I mean, on the decline in the yields of the U.S., or the rise of the yields of U.S. Treasury. So, yeah, I think you're, you're probably right, uh, about that. But, uh, so the U.S. economy is doing fairly well for various reasons, but we're going to continue to have low interest rates. So, um, I mean, certainly though, Frank, an awful lot of people unemployed. And it isn't the economy that we used to know though, is it? No, it's not. It's, it's changed a lot, and, and change has – it favors those who have the first mover advantage that have that interest of adapting and adjusting. Just like mm-hmm. in my business, the ETFs are Uberizing um, the industry. Mm-hmm. Now, it would be um, – I, I uh, just like the, you know, having a medallion. Yeah, in, in Uberizing. I, yeah. So now one of the things with the near term is that we did the analysis. You can't ETF that because we at times may have 20% cash – of fund flows because we use volatility of the interest rates. So there's this mm-hmm. in, in DNA of volatility, which we've gone back over 30 years of data, and we maximize uh, and we understand. So that's helped us get a five-star ranking. Mm-hmm. But with an ETF, it's all in, all out, all in, all out. And right. uh, so there's some pockets where uh, mutual funds are going to be able to maintain their competitive advantage. I see. Okay. Very good point. All right. Um, you know, you have something called the China Region Fund. You, you, you know, you told us now what your views are on the U.S. economy. Uh, the China Regional Fund, how do you view that part of the world? You know, because a few, you know, after 2008, 2009, we, we sort of depended on China uh, to be the engine of the world's economy and to pull us out of the depths of despair after the Lehman Brothers debacle. So how do you see China now? And, uh, you know, what, what is your reading of it, given I'm sure you have uh, spent some time, and you, you and your staff, thinking about this because you're of the China Region Fund. So what, what are your thoughts about China now and its economy? Well, China's going through a big transition, and it's very important to, to appreciate what, how they're positioning themselves. They've gone after um, corruption, political corruption. Mm-hmm. And and people are sort of cynical about it. However, it's 
it's showing up in Macau. Last yeah. year this time, the best performing stocks were American casinos. Unbelievable. And, and their winnings and money they're making from Macau were home runs. Now it's been a disaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, luxury goods in the, in the discretionary economy, um, that those stocks have taken on the chin. Uh, consumer staples have uh, far outperformed discretionary uh, high-end products, and you read uh, what they've commented on is that it's, there's no doubt the clamping down of correcting that economy and stabilizing, it's in motion, um, and how they're repositioning for consumption domestically. The hot stocks have been their technology stocks, uh, stocks where and their railway, their, their, their super light railway system that they're building all through China and the mm-hmm. subways. Have been, their pockets of incredible strength. The finance sector is also the banks have been on a tear. And they've had government policies starting in the summer with the A shares, which were only for domestic investors. They traded a big discount to, his, to the ADR that was trading here or to the H share. And so they've liberalized that so that you've had this huge arbitrage. So the A share market's taken off. And now they made their MNB convertible into Singaporean dollars. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's something that's going on, even though, even though their GDP has slowed down from exports and big infrastructure, big infrastructure projects, there's been a contraction there, but the overall economy seems to have been shift and turn. Now, what mm-hmm. we are most concerned with when we follow China with the resource sector funds, which have been had a real challenging time, is what's called PMI, Purchasing Manufacturers Index. And on our website, I've published several articles on this of going back and looking at what happens when the one-month PMI goes above the three months as a trend, Positive, and what happens when the one month goes below the three months? So uh-huh. JP Morgan does a global PMI, and the global PMI is highly correlated to the, that it reflects the demand for commodities, because the PMI means that a survey of manufacturers saying we are going to be buying more commodities because we're manufacturing more for buyers that are giving us orders. So that's very mm-hmm. positive for the future. So with that, we have found in the summer the PMI went negative, and you start mm. seeing the commodities take it on the chin. Uh-huh. And whenever the one month goes below the three months, guess what? Oil falls 100% of the time. Copper, wow. 70% of the time. Now, when the one month goes above the three months, the oils and oil stocks six months out, the copper, they rise between 60 and 75% of the time. But huh. when it goes below, it does have a much bigger negative impact. So it's so important to be able to track that, and we still don't have what we had in 2006 and seven, where the world was synchronized, where the global PMI was robust and strong, and global GDP was running at 3%, but the, the PMI was always positive. Now we have this asynchronous type of market. That is, China's strong, America's weak. America's strong, China's weak. Mm-hmm. Um, and the real drag has been Europe. And there's more trade between Europe and China, in fact, than there's between America and China. So the fact that Europe is struggling is greatly impacting China's manufacturing, mm-hmm. which affects the PMI, which affects... So you do have this sort of factor that's driving. But what's positive about all this is we are experiencing one of the most significant global tax breaks. And not by government. It's basically this drop in the price of oil, uh, when you take a look where America's economy is, it will affect fracking, it will affect our oil industry here, but it is a $350 billion tax break globally. Mm. Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, India, Chindia alone, they're both... 40% of the world's population, and they are net oil importers. Indonesia, which produces oil, is a net oil importer. Mm. So you're having a huge tax break for South Africa, which is the biggest economy in Africa. Um, and I think that we're going to start seeing in six months from now a, 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 a renaissance in these economies, just like we're Great. seeing consumer spending in America, Walmart, etc. We've said, buy Tiffany's. You're worried about gold? You're worried about the resource at by Tiffany's stocks at 52 week highs. Very interesting. Well, speaking of gold, then uh, with just three and a half minutes or so left, what is your outlook for 2015? We've had a couple of pretty rough years. 
Well, it really is disappointing for many. It's disheartening. Um, last year we wrote that it's only three times in three decades that we'd had three years where gold stocks were down. Now we're going to have the fourth year. This is unprecedented. Um, seeing uh, we had a gra- great rally last year in the first six months, and then it rolled over and fell. Uh, I think the key factor is interest rates. If you look at when gold peaked at 1900, the 10-year U.S. government bond had a minus 3%. You, you're going to lock in a 3% negative rate of return over 10 years. Mm-hmm. Today, it's plus 50 basis points. Mm-hmm. So there's an inverse relationship so that any time the 10-year is negative, gold goes up. Any time the rates are positive, gold goes down. So it's a factor of what will interest rates do positive or negative next year. And I think they're going to stable. I think we're going to have um, low interest rates. I think gold is going to find a place to stabilize. But I think you're going to start seeing a shrinkage of supply from the mines. And I think you're going to see that China and India, this big tax break, will see GDP per capita showing up in their economies and will get back that love trade, which will be more positive for gold. Now, the DNA of volatility of gold, it's a non-event for gold to go plus or minus $150. It's this normal DNA volatility. So gold could run, you know, tri- trip down to a $1,000 level, or it could easily go back over 1350 That mm-hmm. would just be as normal. Is it going to 1900 I don't think so, unless we get strong GDP capital growth, that PMI, very positive emerging countries, and we have negative interest rates in America. All right, Frank, just uh, with about a minute left, you know, I want to ask you the uh, oil prices, energy prices declining, as you mentioned, is good for consumers. I'm wondering uh, if you think oil prices will remain at lower levels, at say 60 bucks or so, that that might not also be very helpful to some of the major bulk mining companies, the companies that have to move huge amounts of rock to get an ounce of gold out. Might that be a benefit to the bottom line of some of the companies that are in your gold funds? That's a great observation, Jay. That's a great observation because for many of these companies, 35% of their expenses are energy. And uh, there's no doubt this will help uh, with, uh, with, with their overall cost structure. Uh, Chile, uh, is, particularly the copper producers, it will have a significant impact and some of the uh, gold mines in, in South Africa. But I think the, um, uh, and in the U.S., but I, I, I think the real factor is in the oil space is we're going to see huge cuts in exploration development. And one thing about fracking, when you hit a thousand barrels a day a year later, there's only a hundred barrels a day coming out of that well. So yeah. if you cut down on that exploration, the overall surplus we've had of, exp- of producing oil, it will decline rapidly, and then you'll see the price of oil firm back up, probably to seventy, eighty dollars. Okay, Frank. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, really great to talk to you again. So much more to cover. I hope we can have you on again sometime in the near future. Thanks for joining me today. Wishing everyone health and wealth in 2015. Thank you, Frank.